Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, Garth McKenzie here coming to you again for this high probability trading course light. Um, this is a five part webinar series. So we're on week number four this week. So we've done this, the first three that you can see there in the slides, the playing in the right sectors and looking at relative strength analysis. We've done that. Uh, second week, we did uh, high probability chart patterns. Last week, we looked at money management and risk management, the secret source, as I called it, which is where I think your success or failure really is determined in, in trading. Now, this week is the fourth week, second last week of this webinar series, and we're going to put it all together in building your trading playbook. So a playbook is, is, is well, in, in theater terms, I think you know what a playbook is. In trading terms, it's like your trading plan or it's your instruction manual. It's what dictates how you trade, when you trade, what you trade, what has to happen in order for a trade to be valid. And it's important to do this because I think in, in the trading world, there's so much sort of freedom of expression and there's so much to trade. There's thousands and thousands of different markets yeah, for stocks, commodities, bonds, indices, currencies, you name it. There's, there's a lot out there. So you can easily get bamboozled by all of it. Uh, and you need to have some sort of a strategy. It, it, you have to have a plan in this business, in my experience. You can't just wing it. Because if you just wing it, you, you know, you, you, you're you vulnerable to all sorts of problems. So this week, we're going to talk about putting it all together and building a, tra a trading playbook. Um, so we'll start with these main uh subheadings, if you will, deciding what markets you're going to trade, creating your own trading rules, what criteria need to be present for a trade to be valid, and then managing yourself, which is really important, and managing your risk. Um, so I'll go through it, and I'm going to take you through my own playbook, effectively, once we get into the meat of these slides. This is a couple of introduction slides here. What I will just quickly say as a matter of housekeeping is, obviously, you're welcome to answer uh, to ask questions at any time. Uh, I will probably only get to all of the questions at the end of the webinar. Um, we've got an hour, and there's quite a lot for me to get through. So I'm going to whisk through it as quick as I can, so that we can leave some time at the end for questions and answers. And I know you've been ask, asking some great questions in the last couple of sessions. Uh, so the first point is deciding what markets you'll trade. Now, as I said before, there's a lot out there in the world that you could trade. You can't be an expert on everything. It's just not possible. So you need to almost define what the universe is of uh, products that you're going to trade you know, and decide, are you an equities trader or are you more in inclined to trade Forex or commodities? Or do you want to be an index trader like trading the Aussie future or the S&P 500 or the DAX, et cetera? Um, but decide what it is that you're going to trade so that you can kind of put a box around that and say, right, that's my universe of things I can trade. Those are the things I'm going to learn to understand well. And that's where I will go and seek out my trading opportunities. Um, don't try and be, you know, all things to all people. It's just, you, you, you'll spread yourself too thin. So it is important to decide up front what it is that you're going to trade. Um, sorry. Uh, and, and, and the key also is that this universe mustn't be too big. You know, certainly in the beginning, you don't want a universe of things to follow that are too big to handle. And it depends on the amount of time that you've got as well at your disposal to actually do your homework. Um, I'm a big believer that you should do your homework outside of market hours, looking for trade setups, looking for levels, identifying them and almost setting alerts to to tell you when those levels are reached. Um but then, of course, your research time is also defined by the amount of time that you have available to do that that market research outside of hours. And if you don't have a lot of time, then you shouldn't have a big universe. If you do have more time, well, then you can afford to make your universe a little bit bigger. But I think it's an important starting point is to decide what you'll trade and actually know what's in that universe of tradable products of yours. Then the next point is creating your own trading rules, which is really what we're going to be talking about here today. So your playbook is your rule book that dictates how you're going to trade. Almost see it like, like a Bible or like an instruction manual that dictates what your or how to operate your trading business. So it'll show you, you know, hey, yes, what to trade, 
when to trade, what has to happen, what criteria need to be present in order for a trade to be valid and in order for you to enact a trade. And then once you've done that, how are you going to manage the risk around that? Uh, it's it's important to have this all planned out as a proper, proper playbook. Uh, and then the last point there is really the, 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 the crux of it is it's all very well to make the rules, but it's also very important to stick to the rules. And I think that is probably one of the hardest parts about, about all of this, because I, I know from experience, you can make all the rules and you can believe that you're going to do the right thing and have a firm set of rules. But we are all human and we all have this tendency to want to bend the rules or see some setup that you think, oh, that's interesting. Oh, wow. have a go. And maybe it doesn't, it, it doesn't conform to any of the rules that you've set up. So it's you, you you need to make the rules, but then you also need to be the policeman that sits there and, and actually makes sure you you know almost have like a little trading policeman on your shoulder, making sure that you stick to the rules. And that's also the hard part of this. All right. So what I'm going to do now is take you through various different aspects of my own uh trading playbook here. And <clears throat> I've effectively just honestly copied and pasted the slides off of the trading playbook that I follow. Um, I've presented this in other formats before, and it is also presented in my full high probability trading course, which is available online. And if you want to see that full course, you can get it off my uh, website, traderscorner.co.za. There's a link to the course there and you can then enroll. Um, but I'm going to go through this in, in relative detail now and show you how it looks. So this is effectively the first starting point for my own trading playbook. I, number one, in the top row of this table, I've identified the trading environment. So what kind of environment are we in? Are we in a rising trend environment? And that's dictated or that's determined or illustrated by your moving averages all pointing upwards, your 50-day, your 15-day, and your 200-day moving averages all pointing upwards. That's a rising trend environment. Then you get a choppy sideways range-bound environment. So that's where your moving averages are generally moving along sideways. Then you get a downtrend environment, which is defined by all the moving averages pointing downwards. And then I've got special situations here, and there's two specific special situations that we'll talk about. So those are the types of environments, first of all, that we look at, because it's the markets change. It's not always an uptrend environment. It's not always a downtrend environment. Now, the markets only trend for a certain period of time. A lot of the time, they also spend chopping around. So it's important to identify the kind of environment that you're in and then say, right, if we are in you know, a choppy environment or sideways environment, these are the types of trading strategies that we're going to employ. Or if we're in a rising trend environment, then these are the trading strategies that we would look to employ. Okay, so number two, the second row of this is all the strategies, and they're each numbered, and we're going to go through each of these individual strategies one by one in, in the following slides. But effectively, in a rising trend environment, I've got buying off an uptrend support, and then there's continuation patterns, some of the stuff we discussed in the second webinar two weeks ago, um, bull flags, falling wedges, triangles, head and shoulders failures, breakouts through resistance and pullbacks into a gap. All right. And then, sorry. And then um, at the bottom, you've got the risk. And that, that's also very important to have that in your playbook. De determine what the risk parameters are for each of your trades. Okay. So in my own case, I've set my maximum risk at 0.75% of my capital. And that's that's my choice, right? I know I said to you when we talked about risk management last week, you should never risk more than 2% of your capital on an individual trade. And I stand by that, but it, it can be a number less, okay? And I, I've found as I've gotten older and I suppose more responsibilities and maybe there's more to lose, I don't want to take as much as 2% risk on an individual trade because when the clusters come, those 2% plus 2%, you know, they add up after and you, you can find yourself in quite a big drawdown quite quickly. So for my for my purposes, the the number is 0.75%. And I can then add to those, I can add to a winner, and particularly in the trending environments, not so much in this in the sideways environment. So if you'll see there in the rising trend environment, I'm allowed to add to winning trades, but obviously then it means also ratcheting stop losses up to keep the risk contained. 
In sideways choppy markets, I won't want to add to positions, right? I'll rather just take a position and stick with it. In a downtrending environment, I'll same risk, 0.75% of capital at risk. And I'm willing to add to that if the market allows, but obviously keeping the risk contained all along. And then the special situations here, we'll talk about them in, in, in more detail, but overreactions in, in either direction, and then blow off tops or short squeezes and how you can trade against those by fading them. And there again, I won't look to add to those. Okay, so that's sort of the overall bird's eye view of my trading plan, if you will. Now, what we're going to go and do is go into each of these setups. You can see that I've labeled them. There's 18 of them. And hence why I say we've got quite a lot of work to get through here, because to go and talk to you about each one of these 18 setups is going to take some time. But let's do it. Okay. So the first one is in a rising trend environment, and it's buying off of uptrend support. So relatively straightforward. I spoke to you in previous se sessions about identifying a trend and identifying buying off of an uptrend. It's simple enough. Join your three or more low points. Look for a reversal off the trend line to buy. Buy and set a stop loss below the lowest point of the reversal. A couple of characteristics that need to be present. Obviously, I want the 15-day moving average to be above the 50-day moving average, and that must be above the 200-day. That, by its very nature, ensures that I've got the direction of travel in my favor. So I'm trading with the momentum. I'm not fighting any momentum. Um, the relative strength index, the RSI, generally I want it to be above 50 odd. So the, remember your RSI is a reading between zero and 100. And in a rising trend environment, you'll find that your RSI tends to stay in the upper half of that band. So you'd want it to be above 40 to 50. Um, the reversal of an uptrend support triggers the entry. Stop loss below a reversal low. As I say, ride a profit while the price is above the uptrend and the 15-day exponential moving average. Risk, 0.75% of capital, as I said, on the initial trade. And I can add to winners, but then what I need to do is ensure that if I, if I do add to winners, I almost want to treat each addition as a new trade, but also manage, manage, making sure that the overall uh, risk is managed such that I then ratchet stop losses up to keep that overall risk on the trade defined at, at any one given point in time. All right, the next uh, item in the rising trend environment is a bull flag pattern. So there you can see it illustrated quite clearly. Uh, and this is what we talked about two weeks ago in the high probability patterns. You've got a flag pattern forms, consolidates. You look to buy the breakout through the top of the flag and you'd have a stop loss below the lowest point in the flag. Um, again, your characteristics are that your price action needs to be above all of those moving averages. They should all be pointing upwards. And also um, your RSI, again, holding in the upper half of the range. Then uh, price above the 15-day exponential moving average and breaking the upper end of the flag pattern is what triggers the buy. Okay. Stop loss below the lowest point in the flag, um, and we'll ride a profit while it's above the 15-day exponential moving average or up to a measured target as well. But if you want to run a profit holding it while it's above the 15-day EMA, I find keeps you in on a rising trend. And uh, risk, same, 0.75% of capital, and you can add to winners, but treat each addition as a, as a separate trade. All right, that's that one. Then a falling wedge uh, is also in a rising trend environment. So again, not, we talked about this two weeks back. You've got the overall rising trend. Again, all of your moving averages are pointing upwards. Um, your RSI is in the upper half of the trading of, of the panel, above 50. Uh, price is, is above the 15-day exponential moving average, and it breaks above the top of the wedge pattern. That's what triggers the entry. Okay, and the stop loss is then below the lowest point of the falling wedge before the breakout occurred. Um, and you want to ride a profit while it's while the price is above the 15 EMA. Again, same risk parameters, and you can add to winners on this. What I hope you can see here is that we're starting to build this up. So I'm saying to you, these are these are certain things I want to see present in order for me to activate a trade. So I'm not just willy-nilly 
saying, oh, today I feel like buying Nuspis because it's down, you know, or I'm, you know, going to short some XYZ stock because it's it feels like it's gone up too much. These are specific, well-defined, clearly defined rules in terms of what needs to be present in order to enact a trade. Now, of course, <clears throat> these things don't just fall out of the sky at you. You need to look for them. And that's what I spend a lot of my research time doing before the market opens and on the weekends, keeping an eye out for patterns that are setting up and identifying levels. Because I, I liken it to scratching scratching for diamonds. You know, If you're scratching around, you'll find them. If you scratch a lot, you'll find more. Um, and every once in a while, you dig out a big diamond, but you'll probably dig out lots of little small diamonds, assuming you've, you're in a assuming you're in a diamond field. Okay, but I think you get the point of the metaphor is that I know what I'm looking for, but I need to scratch around to try and find these things. Okay, and and hence, the, what I'm looking for is what we're talking about here in all of these setups. Okay. The next one, also in a rising trend environment, is a triangle pattern. And we also spoke about these two weeks back. So here is a, an example of an ascending triangle. Um, it's got the five waves evident that we spoke about previously when we took, talked about triangles. And again, here are the characteristics. I, I want all those moving averages to be pointing upwards because that implies that the momentum is in my favor. RSI needs to be above 40 or 50 in the upper half of the pane. Um, the break above the top of the triangle pattern is what triggers my entry. Stop loss below the lowest swing low before the breakout occurred. Right, And I'm going to ride a profit while the price is above the 15-day exponential moving average or until it reaches a target, a measured target from the triangle pattern. And again, because this is a rising trend type of setup, I'm allowed to add to the trade if I if I want to, but of course keeping that overall risk intact such that it's at max at 0.75% of capital. So I can make the position bigger, but I then need to tighten the stop loss in order to keep the risk parameters well defined. Okay. And then I think this is the, the might might be the last or one of the last ones in a in the rising trend environment. Um there's actually another one after this. This is a head and shoulders failure. Now, you might look and say, that's quite weird. Like, why do we look for head and shoulders failures? Typically, you look at a head and shoulders pattern to be a top. Um, and yes, you do. But actually, in my experience, they're not very reliable patterns to, to look for a top as a head and shoulder. What I find actually is a better pattern and works pretty well is when you get a head and shoulders that fails. Um, and they say what from failed moves come fast moves in the opposite direction. So here you've got an example of a head and shoulders busy mapping out. But when it breaks above the top of the right shoulder, now that means that the patterns failed. So what you would have expected might be a weak, a weak break to the downside. That didn't happen. Instead, it's moved to the upside. And what often then happens is actually you get some natural buying that follows or you get short covering or both. In fact, usually it's both. And that's what drives the price higher. So the criteria that I'm therefore looking for is that I actually want the price, again, all the moving averages need to be pointing upwards generally um, and price to be breaking above the 15-day exponential moving average. Um, again, RSI needs to be in the upper half of the panel. And then the break above the top of the right shoulder and above the right uh, above the 15-day EMA uh, is what triggers the entry. Being on the right side of the 15-day EMA always gives you the, the upper hand. It puts you on the right side of the momentum. So it's just something, you know, if you, we're talking about high probability trading here, that's something that puts the probability very much in your favor. If you're on the right side of that 15-day exponential moving average, I would say automatically that gives you better than 50-50 odds of being successful. Okay, so it's just it's a useful filter to apply. Um, stop loss then below uh, the lowest point on the right shoulder of the pattern, as indicated there. I'm going to ride a profit whilst the price is above the 15 EMA. 
And again, my risk parameters, 0.75% of capital. Um, and I can add to a winner if it's if the setup allows for it, but obviously keeping that overall risk very much limited to the 0.75% that I've said I'm willing to accept. All right, and then this is a breakout, uh, a breakout through resistance. So, and still in a rising trend environment here. So again, all the criteria are similar. We want all the moving averages to be pointing upwards. We want the price action to be above the moving averages. Um, and we want the RSI to be in the upper half of the panel. And a break above resistance, like I've illustrated there, there's two, two examples where the breakout occurred. That's what triggers the entry. Okay, stop loss below the most recent swing low before a breakout occurred. Okay, so if I was buying that little breakout over there, I would have probably put a stop down here or more conservatively, maybe below that low over there, depending on the, the time frame. Um, but it, it needs to go, the, the stop loss needs to be at a place where it's clear that my trade's not working. That's really what I want to see. I don't want to get stopped out by volatility. I just want to get stopped out when it's clear that the trade is wrong and it's not going in my favor. Um, all right, so you can ride a profit while above 15 EMA again, risking 0.75% of capital. And again, you can add to winners here if the market presents opportunities to then add, but obviously keeping the risk, uh, overall risk of that trade setup contained to 0.75% of capital. You notice how I keep on stressing the point about managing the risk, managing the risk. It's important. That's why I keep on stressing it. Managing your risk is the most, the most important part of trading. You know, not losing too much when you're wrong is critical. And that's why it's always got to be at the at the forefront of of everything. And then this one, strategy seven is a pullback into a gap, also still in a rising trend environment. So gaps like that happen usually. It's an overnight gap where some news has come out, and it's positive in this case because you've got a gap up. Sometimes gaps are to the downside, but in this case, a positive news event comes out, the price gaps up. And what you typically find is that gaps like that will provide support in time when the price pulls back into the gap. So it did here on this chart of Unilever, which worked out quite well. In terms of the characteristics, you want your 15 EMA to be above your 50 day and that to be above your 200 day moving average. You want them pointing upwards. Um, you want your RSI to be in the upper end of the, the range again above 50. The pullback into the gap and then a reversal up off the lower end of the gap is what triggers an entry to buy. Okay. Um, stop loss below a reversal low. You're going to ride the profit while the price is above the 15 day exponential moving average. And again, 0.75% of capital at risk. That's my rule. Um, and you can add two winners. And on the 0.75% risk, just remember, you know, that's that's my rule. It's what I've decided, but you can go up to two percent if you if you feel so inclined. It, it's it's something you need to put in your playbook, though, and that's what I'm saying. You know, these are things straight out of my playbook that I'm showing to you. I'm not saying this is exactly what you have to do and what you have to put in your playbook. You know, you might want to have fewer setups to look for. Um, you might change the risk parameter slightly, etc. But the point is, you need to define it all. So I'm showing you what I've done. Uh, you can use this as a template if you want to, and you can then modify it for your own needs. But I think it's just a, it's it's useful to look at it from a conceptual point of view in terms of what it looks like to actually create a playbook or a trading plan. <clears throat> right. Now we're moving into the sideways, choppy, range-bound type of environment. Okay. Um, so this is strategy number eight. Uh, characteristics now have changed. So we got the 15 day EMA could be moving up or down because it's quite a short term moving average. Your 50 day moving average is generally fairly flat or sideways ish and similar for your 200 day moving average. So as you can see in this example here, the 200 day is sideways, the 50 day moving average is sort of, sort of going sideways. Um, and the RSI in these cases oscillates up and down above 50 and below 50. 
because it's not a trending environment. So, you, you know, in a, in a rising trend, your RSI will stay in the upper half of that, pa uh, that panel. But in a choppy environment like this, it'll go up and down and up and down, oscillating around the middle of that pane. Um, all right, so you look for your, you, you look to identify your range boundaries where there's support and where there's resistance. And you'd look for a, a reversal up off of a range uh, range bottom to trigger a buy. You could also look for a short as well if you're wanting to trade off the top of a range. Um, but in this case, what you'd look for is a reversal off the bottom of the range, buy it with a stop loss underneath the reversal low. And typically, you're then going to look for a move back up to the other end of the range boundary to sell into that sort of strength and capture that you're effectively capturing the volatility in a sideways choppy market in this case i don't want to be adding to my winners because it's not a trending environment i'd rather only add to winners when i'm in a trending environment so in this is in this case it's not a trending environment therefore my rules dictate that i won't add to a winner i'll just go in with my initial position size and stick with that until it gets to the target area and then take the profit. I'm not going to add to a, to a trade in this kind of an environment. Um, and why is that? Why would I not add to a trade in a sideways environment? Well, because it's sideways by the very nature of the fact that it's sideways, it's choppy. It means that you could actually get chopped up and, and the volatility could catch you out. So I don't want to make my position bigger you know, at a worse price by adding to it in a choppy sideways kind of an environment. I'd only want to do that in a trending environment where I know that the momentum is, is at my back. All right, the next here is strategy number nine. This is the cup and handle pattern. So there you can see it illustrated quite clearly. There's the cup with the handle. So it looks like a sort of like a teacup. And you've got that rim line over there, which is the where, where you'd look for the breakouts to occur. And again, this is something that is, is more evident in a choppy kind of an environment, but it's also usually a signal of a change of direction as well, change in trend. Um, so here your characteristics are, again, you want your 50-day moving average and your 200s to be relatively sideways, flattish. Um, the, oscillator, the, the RSI oscillates up and down above and below 50 uh, the break above the top of the, the rim of the cup and handle pattern is what triggers the entry. And then you'd look for a stop loss below the lowest point, the bottom of the handle pattern. And then the, the target is the height of a of the pattern projected to the upside. Um, and again, here I'm looking for the, the, uh, the I'm looking to risk 0.75% of, of capital. And I won't look to add on this one. <clears throat> all right and then we're going to now move into a downward trending environment so this is now completely the opposite of a rising trend environment this is where you're going to be looking to try and initiate short trades in a downtrend environment okay so um different different kind of thing to do shorting by and large is not as easy as buying um you know you need the right type of environment for it and I'll say, I mean, bull markets, bullish markets are easier to trade. There's just no doubt about that. But if you've got your wits about you, there are ways to make money in a downtrending environment. And I've got a couple of strategies here that I look for specifically to make money in a downtrending environment. So the first one is shorting off of a downtrend resistance line. So here you can see you've got a downtrend intact. It joins all these high points. And each time the price gets to one of those high points, it stops and it reverses to the downside. So that's your, uh, your downtrend quite clearly intact. From a characteristics point of view, you want your 50-day moving average. Uh, well, your 15 must be below your 50, and that must be below your 200. And they're all pointing downwards. That is what dictates or defines the downward trend. In a downward trend, your RSI relative strength index sits in the lower half of the pane. So below 50 or 60, the, price, the, the RSI is generally in the lower half of that pane. You'd look for a reversal off of the downtrend to trigger an entry. Stop loss above a reversal high, and then you ride the profit while the price is below the downtrend and below the 15-day EMA. Okay, and then risk 0.75% of capital on a trade, you can add to winners here, but 
I'll say that it's harder to do that adding to, in a downtrend. You can do it, but you know, what you need to be careful of in a downtrending environment is where you get these short, sharp squeezes that push the price up very quickly. Uh, and, and, and that's where you can come out, you come unstuck quite quickly. So if you are adding to short trades, you've got to be careful and be very, you've got to have your wits about you in terms of managing the risk and trailing your stop losses. The next one is the bear flag pattern in a downward trend environment. So again, uh, the criteria are such that we want our moving averages to be pointing downwards, the 15 day moving average below the 50 and and so on. So all moving averages generally, particularly your, your 50 day and your 15 day EMA are the ones you want to be pointing to the downside. Um, a break below the bottom of the flag structure is what triggers an entry over there. And you'd put a stop loss below, sorry, above the top of the top or the highest point of a bear flag structure over there. All right. And you can add to winners. Again, my 0.75% is my risk, it's my capital at risk. Yeah. And you can add to winners on these. But like I said, adding to winners in the short side of the market is not an easy thing to do. So just be conscious of that. You've got to manage those risks very, very carefully when you're on the short side. Okay. And then, um, the rising wedge, so this is again a continuation pattern in a declining trend. So I'm looking for these types of setups. Uh, the 15-day EMA below the 50 and below the 200, that, and they're all pointing down. That's what indicates to me that the momentum is downwards. And therefore, if I'm shorting, I'm trading with the direction of travel. I'm not trying to fight the market. Um, and again, in a downtrend, your relative strength index holds below 50 in the bottom half of that pane. Uh, the break below the lower end of the rising wedge pattern is what triggers a short sale entry point and then a stop loss above the highest point of that rising wedge before the break to the downside occurred. And you'd ride a profit whilst the price is below the 15 EMA or it reaches a particular target that you have in mind. And again, risk 0.75% of capital. Uh, and you can add to these if you are willing to. But again, like I said, just be careful adding to, to winners on the short side because they can snap back quite hard quite quickly. Then uh, strategy number 13 is a triangle in a downward trend environment. So remember, triangles can be continuation patterns in either direction. So we've talked about a triangle in a rising trend environment. Now we're talking about a triangle in a, in a declining trend environment. And in this case, you, you want your moving averages pointing to the downside, particularly the 50-day and the 15 EMA, and ideally your 200-day moving average as well. In this example, it's the 200-day moving average is not, not quite in the right position, but it would be higher probability setup if all of the moving averages were pointing to the downside. Um, RSI holds below 50, like I said, and a break below the lower end of a triangle pattern is what would trigger the entry. Uh, stop loss above the highest point of the, the swing high before the break to the downside occurred out of the triangle pattern. And again, ride your profit while price is below the 15 EMA or down to a, a triangle target. And same with risk parameters, 0.75% of capital risked on an individual trade. Um, and you can add to a winner in these cases if you want, but you've got to just be cautious and careful about short squeezes, like I said. And then an inverted head and shoulders failure. But, so here again, it's it's not conventional to what you might normally think. You look for an, uh, for an inverted head and shoulders pattern often to be a bottoming pattern and for the price to break up. And they work sometimes, but sometimes they don't. And I actually find a failed pattern often is the um, is, is a higher probability pattern to trade off of in, the, in this case, a failed inverse head and shoulders pattern. So here you've got price generally trending downwards below all of the moving averages here, or all of your moving averages pointing to the downside. Um, RSI sticking around the lower half of its range generally. Uh, and then the breakdown below the bottom of the right shoulder of an inverse head and shoulders pattern is what would trigger the entry. Uh, stop loss then above the neckline of that inverse head and shoulders pattern. And you're going to ride a profit while the price is below the 15 EMA. 
as it is in this case here. And again, risk 0.75% of capital on a trade. Um, you can add to a winner, but like I said, again, just be cautious of short squeezes and make sure that your overall position risk is contained once you've added to the trade. Okay, then strategy number 15 is a breakdown through support. So here you've got an example of a stock that's been making lower highs every time it bounces it rallies but it makes a lower high and bounces uh, and, and comes back down to test the support and usually when you see a setup like this where the support line just gets tested and tested and tested and tested it's kind of like I often think about it like you know banging a wall with a hammer or a sledgehammer eventually if you bash it enough times you're probably going to break through it um, and that works on both the upside and the downside so if the price bumps up against resistance over and over and over and over eventually it breaks through but the same token in this example where price trades down to the support over and over and over and over but each time it's making a successively lower high well that's telling you that the buyer that the, the sellers are the stronger force here and that when this thing eventually resolves it's probably going to break in the direction of the stronger force which is down in this case so what you're looking for here for the break below support is you want all of your moving averages to be pointing down again and for the 15 EMA to be below the 50 day and that to be below the 200 day moving average. RSI must be in the lower half of the pane in, in indicating a weakening trend. And then um, either there's two ways that you can either trade this. Either you can look to try and short when you get a rally and you get a reversal down from a from a lower high point okay that'll give you a good risk to reward ratio if you do that because you'll know your stop loss can be quite tight the other way is you can actually just short once it breaks down below the support level and then you've got more confirmation either is fine but um, again whichever way you choose to do it uh, you, you're going to set the risk parameter the same at 0 0.75 percent for my for my rules um, and you're going to ride a profit while the price is below the 15 uh, EMA okay in this example here you got that beautiful break to the downside a rally back up to retest that what was previously support and then becomes resistance so you could have had an, another opportunity actually to re-enter a trade on the retest uh, for another leg to the downside so you could have probably traded this on the short side twice in a fairly short space of time which would have worked out quite nicely all right um then we talk about gaps again, but in this case, we're looking at a gap to uh, a downside gap. And again, this is in a weakening environment. So where you get a gap to the downside, that'll often be caused by, can be caused by negative news flow, but often it can also be caused by a stock that maybe goes ex-dividend of, of a large divvy. So that could be something that causes it. But usually there's an event of some nature that causes the price to gap to the downside. And what you're looking at here is for the price to then rally back up into the gap, fill the gap, and then reverse down again. So there's a nice example here on this chart uh, twice where it did it quite in, in succession quite quickly. Um, gap down, rally up into the gap, fills the gap, and it falls away again. And then it did it again in, in the July of this year. Gap to the downside, rally up, fill the gap, and fall away. So if you were wanting to initiate a trade off of this type of setup then you'll have your criteria are such that you need your moving averages to be pointing downwards to indicate a declining trend um, the rsi sits in the lower half of the pane and you're going to look for that bounce up into the gap and then a reversal off the upper end of that gap will be what triggers the entry remember the reversal tells you that the in this case a downward reversal is telling you that buyers have exhausted and sellers are now taking over control and that's why the reversal is important because it gives you an indication that actually there are other sellers out there you're not just randomly trying to go and pick a level to go short okay um, stop loss would be above a reversal high and you'd ride a profit whilst the price is below the 15 ema or down to a measured target and again risk is 0.75 percent of capital here uh, and you can add to a winner if there's an, a setup that allows for it. But again, managing that overall 
position risk such that it's not more than your defined risk amount. And in my case, it's 0.75%. Okay, <clears throat> now there's two special situations that I have in my playbook. And these are them. So this is strategy number 17. Um, it's a, what I call a three day or four day rule overreaction to news. So it's something that we've observed many times in the market over many years is that when you get shock news that comes out, and if in this case, it's usually going to be negative news. I mean, it can sometimes be positive and it goes the other way, but more often than not, these types of setups come about on negative news. So it's where something happens in the market could be an earnings surprise or something else uh, where the price, the market is, is negatively surprised and shocked by that news. Typically speaking, it takes about three days, sometimes four days for the market to digest that information before the price will stabilize. So if you ever see a share price that's you know down on the day because of bad earnings number or something like that, usually you shouldn't just rush out and try and pick a bottom on day one. Um, usually what you actually want to do is sit back and wait, wait for three days, because invariably the third day or the fourth day, depending, is when the stability starts to settle in. And that's actually usually when, once you can then say, right, the price has overreacted, it's likely to stage a bit of a, a, a reflexive rally to recover some of that overreaction. And that's, this particular strategy, this three-day rule strategy is all about that. It's all about just trying to quickly capture the, the, the mean reversion or the capture the overreaction to the share price. Okay, so here are the characteristics. A shock news event causes a violent sell-off in the stock. Strategy seeks to take advantage of the overreaction and subsequent snapback rally. So what needs to be present? Well, you need a shock news event. You need three or four days of aggressive selling. Very high volume. That's also important. Notice the volume spike over here. Okay, this incidentally was when Facebook had a scandal around uh, privacy data some time back. And the share price got a, a big smack and over three days it eventually stabilized and recovered some of the some of the loss um then what you'd want to then do is drill into your shorter time frame look for an hourly candle and wait for the hourly on the th third or fourth day once you can see that stability is setting in look for the price action to then break above a previous hourly high on an hourly candle chart um, that's what then triggers the buy Okay, and use a stop loss below the lowest point before that occurred. Okay, so you're waiting for an hourly candle that breaks above the high of the previous hourly candle. And then when that happens, that's your buy point. But you're going to set a stop loss wherever the lowest point was before that occurred. That's where you're going to set your stop loss. Okay, and the idea here is that you're looking for a quick in and out. You're not going to hang around in this type of trade setup for too long. You, you're generally going to look for about a 5 to 10% bounce over the coming days. And, um, and then you sell into that. That's the, that's the strategy. Uh, it's quick. It's in and out. You generally know your fate fairly quickly. And you'll know within a week, in all, in all likelihood, you'll know within a week um, whether this trade has worked out or not. And you know exactly where your stop loss is. And again, you know your risk parameter. I set it at 0.75%. And there's no adding to the trade in this case. Okay. Uh, all I'm trying to do is capture that overreaction and a bounce back up uh, to, to some level of normality. I'm not adding to a trade with this type of trade setup. So that's the three-day rule. And I must say, over the years, we've generally had quite, quite good success with this strategy. Um, and then the opposite of this is, is a blow off top or a short squeeze exhaustion. So, and that can come about from a number of things, but it doesn't always have to be about around news. There's like many cases, a short squeeze, there's no, there isn't news. It's just the market gets collectively too skewed to the short side. And as the price moves up, so the shorts lose money and they start to get scared and nervous and they start to buy back the price buy back the stock and as they buy it back it pushes the price higher which sucks in more buying and slowly you eventually you get a blow off panic short squeeze okay and that's where you get these types of crazy moves to the upside where the price basically goes up vertically 
Um, those types of moves usually are short-lived and they usually do retrace quite quickly after the exhaustion has happened and once the dust is sort of settled. So the characteristics by my rules are that the price must spike aggressively higher by more than 20% within a week, okay? And I know some of you might say, okay, what if it only goes up 18% or 19%, okay? Well, maybe, but the rules that I've set here, are, I want to see it more than 20% in a week um, if I'm going to be hard about the about enforcing the rules. So move a 20% up over five days, a volume spike. Again, now the volume spike often indicates a short squeeze as well, where you've got sort of panic on the way up because the shorts are all scrambling to cover. But then at the same token, you've also got people willing to sell at such an elevated price as well. So you get a volume spike. Um, then you get a daily reversal candle to the downside. Okay, that's what indicates that the price is exhausted. Uh, and then a stop loss, that, that would be your trigger point. Your stop loss will be the highest point of that reversal candle. And then you'd look to cover the short into a 5 to 10% pullback over the next one to three weeks. And as I said, usually is fairly quick. One to three weeks, you should get your result and then you take your profit. Um, again, the risk here, I'm willing to lose 0.75% on an individual trade in this setup, and I won't be adding to it. Won't be adding to a winner in this kind of setup. I'm just going to go in with an initial position size, and then that's that, and stick with it. Um, and yeah, you should get your result fairly quickly. So those are the 18 um, setups that I have in my playbook. So 18 setups is quite a lot. Do I need so many? Possibly not. But the thing is that when I'm going and I'm scanning through all of my charts on the weekend or before the market opens or whatever, essentially, I'm looking for these things. I'm looking for one of these 18 setups to be present. And when it's present, then I know what I'm going to do because the rules are there and they're quite clear. Um, I know how I'm going to trade. I know what the trigger point is for the entry. I know where the stop loss needs to be etc. All the rules are pretty clear. And like I said at the beginning, this is an instruction manual that dictates how I'm going to how I'm going to trade. All right, there's a couple of last points to make here before we get into the questions and answers. So discipline, and the, the, again, this is cut and paste, copied straight from my my trading book, my trading playbook, which is a Word document that I keep open on my computer. Um, so these are some of the other points. Discipline. Every trade entered must comply with one of the strategies identified here. No deviating, no impulsive trades. Okay. I'd love to say that I'm completely disciplined about this, and that I never do impulsive trades. I'd be lying. Um, I try to be disciplined and I'm still trying. Okay. But and I'm getting better at it. But if you're really going to be strict, you know, You've got a playbook, stick to it. Don't deviate from it and don't do things that are impulsive that don't form part of the plan. Um, total trades at once. This is also something you need to put into your playbook because this then helps you to manage your overall portfolio risk, which is something we spoke about in last week's session. Um, so I've said that there's a maximum of six trades allowed to be open at any one time. Um, a trade where a winner is added is still considered to be one trade, Okay. So just, just keep that in mind. Time stop loss of four weeks on each trade. Um, I think that that's a good enough amount of time to see whether a trade is working or not. Uh, if it's not working within four weeks, often even sooner than that, then it's not good, probably not going to work. Then you should just move on. Save your capital, save your mental capital, go find something else to do. Um, you know, don't, don't hold on to trades forever and hope that they're going to come right. You need to see your trades working for you quite quickly. And if they're not, then move on. And then portfolio risk. So um, the total portfolio should never be leveraged more than 150%. Okay, so 1.5 times gearing, which might sound low to some of you. Um, you know, I know that they say, oh, CFDs, you can get 10 times gearing. If you're going to gear your account 10 times, I promise you, you're going to blow it up at some point. Um, so don't. You know, I've found over the years and over the years when I was doing my Traders Corner TV show in South Africa, I tracked the leverage that I had. And it was always around about 1.5 times, 150% leveraged. 
So, you know, the notion that you need to take on big leverage to make a lot of money is, a, is false. You know, you, yes, you can make a lot of money, but you can also lose your entire account if you've got too much leverage going on. So for me, 150% leverage is a good number. And I feel that that's, you know, gives me a bit of exposure, decent leverage to make some money when the going is good. Uh, but it also means that when there's when the the losses come around, they're not going to kill me either. Okay, um, and then obviously, uh, um, what that then means because of the positions limitation being six positions open at once, I can't have more than twenty five percent of the total capital available in a single position. Okay, in total number of trades per year. So this is a rule that I've set myself starting from this year, actually last year. Um, I want to try and ensure that I don't do more than 100 trades per year. Now, that's me. I mean, I'm not, not saying you have to do this. It's just it's in terms of my own rules, my own style of trading to my personality, I felt this was a good rule to put into my playbook. No more than 100 trades per year. Each trade needs to comply with the setups and the rules defined in each one of these setups that we've listed here. Okay, So patience will be key in waiting for the setups to appear and then allowing them the time to work. Now, 100 trades per year is basically two trades a week. Okay, It's not a lot of trades. Um, but what it also means is that you're going to be waiting around for the high probability trades. And if you're doing that, you know, A, your probability of making money probably is better, but also you're you're managing yourself better. You're, man, you're not, you know, you're not going to exhaust yourself by over trading. Um, so it's something I've, you know, you might say, oh, you want to do 200 trades a year. And that's fine. You know, as long as it's, de it's defined. But for what I find for my purposes, if I say that I'm going to do 100 trades, okay, it's like I've got 100 blocks to tick off during the year you know it's got to count where every time i do a trade it's got to count i'm not just going to do some old trade just for the sake of it because i'm bored you know if i'm scratching off one of those 100 blocks i want to make sure that i'm using it's a it's a worthwhile trade that i'm not wasting the opportunity if if, if it makes sense then documenting trades I'm very big on journaling, and this is where, where, where we talk about documenting trades. So, you know, every trade does get documented. I've got a file where I keep the, you know, I keep them electronically, but I also then keep them physically in a in a file where I print them out. Um, <clears throat> each trade is documented with a detailed description that must accompany the trade. The reason why you want to do a detailed description and document every trade. It's also so that you can go back in the future and look at it and see, okay, did this trade work or didn't it? And what happened afterwards? You know, could I have done something better or not? And you, by doing that, you're able to reevaluate your trades and almost mark yourself and check you, what you do after a while is you know, you start to notice patterns in your trading, patterns of things you do well consistently, as well as patterns that you consistently do things you're doing wrong um and in the, in the spirit of self-improvement you want to try and focus on the things that you're doing well and do more of that and look at the things that you're doing wrong and try and weed that out of your trading um right at the end of the year what you'll be able to do if if you've done this, this documentation and you've listed each of the trades um, is collate the success rate of each of the various strategies as well as the probability rate of each of these strategies and it will help you to build up a healthy understanding of which of these patterns have a higher probability of success for you and which have a lower probability of success so re remember that each one of my 18 strategies there were numbered okay so Whenever I do a trade and it's one of these 18 strategies, I'll list it and I'll say, oh, this is a number one. We're buying off an uptrend support, or this is a trade number, is a strategy number 18, um, shorting and a blow off move. Um, because then what I can do at, uh, over time <clears throat> is actually build up da data and say, okay, so how many of my strategy number one trades worked? How many of my strategy number two trades worked? And after a period of time, you really do start to see, you know, some of these setups work very, very well. And some maybe they're not working so well. So, okay, 
be a little bit more circumspect with the ones that aren't working so well. But the ones that are working well for you, hey, hey you want to do more of those, right? So documenting trades is important. Then a PL curve. Uh, I document the PL curve every day and, and I keep it running on a spreadsheet. The aim here is to to try and achieve a decent annualized return. And that's the key. Um, you know, daily, weekly, monthly returns are not really what I'm aiming for. Um, I'm looking for an annual return. I think putting yourself under pressure to try and come out with an, an a, a daily return rate or even a monthly return rate, is quite tough. Yeah, you know, you're going to have periods where you have a drawdown in your account and you lose a bit of money. It's fine. Um, at the end of the year, what really is going to matter is your annual return. All right. And then the last point there is that the secret is in compounding returns. So individually, each of these trades are not going to make a huge amount of difference to my portfolio, but stringing a number of small wins together adds up. Um, and also adding to the winners will, will add up meaningfully in the cases where I'm allowed to. <clears throat> Keeping losses is key to overall successful trading performance. Um, and as I've said here, the 0.75% risk allowance becomes a larger nominal figure as the portfolio grows. But remember, keeping the, as a percentage, it'll always be 0.75%. But as my portfolio grows, that 0.75% becomes a larger nominal figure that I'm effectively allowed to risk on each trade. And that's how you achieve a compounding of returns as, as a trader. All right, so that's it. This is something that, uh, as a saying my dad used to say to me, and I think it's so true, is failing to plan is planning to fail. So create your trading plan, right, and stick to it. It's like your instruction manual of your trading business. I really, really think it's a very good idea to have it documented so that you know what has to happen in order for a trade setup to be valid, okay, and then act on it. All right, so we're at the end. That's the disclaimer, if you feel like reading that. Um, I'm going to take some questions now. I see we've got five minutes left, but I'll go over a little bit if if we've got a lot of questions to deal with. Um, so, right, let's start here. Mark, Mark Watchhorn. Hi, Mark. You said, hello, Garth. Thanks for another great course and sound advice. Brilliant. Um, your main challenge currently is where to place stop losses. As a swing trader, how long to hold and where to get out? Okay, um, I see that you posted the comment quite early on in the webinar, so I think I, I think I've answered that, Mark, um, in terms of where you place the stop losses on each of the different setups. So, yeah, I, I mean, if not, I know you have my email address and you can contact me if you need more color on that. Uh, Anonymous said, do you always trade daily time frame and do you write out the profit? Do you keep the trade open over a number of days? So yes, um, I, I mostly am trading off of a daily time frame. The, the chart and the main analysis that I'm doing is off a daily chart. However, when it comes to entry points, I'll often then drill down into an hourly chart just to try and finesse an entry. And then the last part of your question, do I keep a trade open over a number of days? Yes. I mean, my style of trading generally is such that I hold trades for a couple of days to a couple of weeks, sometimes even longer than that, a couple of months in some cases. But um, I'm not a day trader. So my strategy is generally to hold for a couple of days to a couple of weeks. <clears throat> and then you asked also anonymous, you said with the head and shoulders failure, how do you know that it's not another right shoulder? Well, you don't. That's that's the point. You you never know for certain in this business anything. There's no guarantees. What I'm saying is that these that that, that head and shoulders failure, in my experience, is a um is is generally a high probability pattern. So it will work most of the time, but there are times when it won't work. And that's why we have a stop loss. Um, with all of these trades, you know, if there was ever a setup that I knew worked with 100% certainty every single time, well, then we wouldn't need stop losses, we could just throw the kitchen sink at it and make a million bucks on every trade. The fact of the matter is, that's just not how it works. So you, you know, you go out there on the presumption that the pattern that you've identified is a high probability pattern, which I believe all of these are. 
Um, but you also keep an open mind to the fact that some things just don't work. And that's why you have to have a stop loss. And that's why you have to manage your risk with every single trade and, and your position size as well. All right. Anonymous, you've also asked, how do you choose which markets to trade? Um, and then, yeah, okay, so that, yeah, how do I choose? So look, I'm an equities trader. And that, the only reason I say that really is because I've been brought up on equities. My first job was in a stockbroking business and then moved into equity CFDs, equity derivatives. So I'm an equities guy, you know, just from the start of my career. I do sometimes look at currencies and trade currencies here and there, um, but most of what I do is equities or equity equity indices. Um, so that's my choice because that's where I come from. You know, if you're a if you're particularly fond of forex or you're particularly fond of commodities, you know, you want to trade oil or gold or or something like that. You know, it's up to you. I think as long as there's liquidity in the markets that you're choosing to trade, then it's fine. But I, I think the point that I really wanted to stress at the beginning is there is you need to know what that universe is. Uh, and I speak, I speak from experience with this. You know, earlier in my career, I've, I've tried to trade all sorts of things. Yeah, there's wheat and maize and like stuff I have no idea about really in terms of how it trades and you think that you can trade this stuff and that actually you just spread yourself too thin so it's better to to become very familiar with a couple of markets rather than to try and watch a thousand markets and think that you're going to be able to trade all of them um, rather become more focused and a bit more of a specialist at a smaller number of markets and understand and learn their trading action well Okay. Um, right. Gordon Simmons, the, the, thanks for an excellent course. Do you take uh, do you take profit when you have a close below 15 EMA, EMA or when the tail of the candle moves through it? Generally a close, uh, Gordon, because you'll find that there's often noise around a 15 EMA where it, it can trade below it intraday, but then not close below it at the end of the day. Um, and then you've asked your Fibonacci levels for take profits. You found these work well. Yeah, so Fibonacci levels we haven't discussed on this course. Um, we do talk about I, I do talk about Fibonacci levels more on the full version of the high probability trading course. Um, but yeah, I mean Fibonacci extensions certainly do help as a as a method to identify a profit taking area. So I think yeah, fine. And as you say, if you've had some experience and you found success with that in the past. Excellent. You know, keep keep doing it. It is a way of uh, of allowing yourself to identify profit targets. Okay, then anonymous as well. You've asked uh, once you find the right sector, how do you choose which stocks to do your homework on, given the amount of available stocks in the sector? Um, I think we kind of covered that though in in the first section of the course or the first lesson where we put all of the stocks into different buckets. Remember, there was a green bucket for the outperformers, a yellow bucket for the neutral stocks, and then a red bucket for the underperformers. So I don't know I don't know if I'm answering the question right, but you said, how do you do the, your homework? Um, look, for me personally, you know, it's, it's a lot of this homework is done just by scanning the charts and eyeballing the charts. And I kind of, flip through a lot of charts looking for the setups i think also what what helps is that having done this for you know 20 plus years as i have you do start to develop an eye for this kind of thing so i find flicking through charts quite quickly i can very see quickly see oh there's a triangle pattern or there's a flag or or whatever and i suppose that that's just an experienced eye that that helps to be able to spot these patterns and nothing gives you that experience other than actually just doing it and, uh, and, and and spending lots of time looking at charts and reading charts. Okay, um, let me just try and get to some other questions here. There's a lot of questions being asked and I wanna make sure that a few other people get a, get a chance. Um, Mark, watch one, you said, could I show strategy three again? Okay, let's just quickly go there. Um, three here we go that's a falling wedge pattern 
So that's basically you've got a rising trend, the price is falling, consolidating into the wedge, pulling back, but it's a still above all the moving averages. And then when it breaks up above the upper end of that wedge pattern, that's what then triggers the buy and you'll put a stop loss below the lowest point of that wedge pattern. Okay, there, there is a recording of this. So if you've missed anything, you can watch the recording afterwards and uh, go over it again. Graham Sterley, you've asked which patterns or strategies have the highest success rate? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. So I find all of the continuation patterns generally have quite a high success rate. Um, and when I say a high success rate, I'm not saying like 90%, it's never as high as that. I'm saying 65%, maybe two out of three trades will work. That's a high success rate when it comes to any market trading strategy. Um, if you can get that sort of level of success consistently, that's a good success rate. Um, but I mean, to be fair, Graham, all of these setups that I've shown here are all high probability trading setups from, from experience. Okay. Um, all right. Then what else have we got here? We're nearly out of time, but I just want to see. Okay, Dan asks, how do you get the previous presentations? They are available on, I think it's on Rand Swiss's YouTube channel. So they should, if you can't find it, then I'll just give Rand Swiss a call. They'll be able to direct you where to get the previous uh, videos of this of this course. Um, okay, then, then Anonymous, you said, Garth, if you're winning, whoopsie, um, if you're, winning trade reached your maximum of 25% of your portfolio, would you look to trim it back? Okay, interesting question. Good question. Um, so what you're saying is you've got a really good trade, it's growing and it, because it's grown, it's become a bigger percentage of your portfolio. And it's, you know, now it's outsized. And I know that this is where, um, interestingly, a lot of the fund managers in South Africa get frustrated because they're bound by very strict rules of regulation 28. You know, you end up being forced to trim your winners back. And in years past, it was a big complaint about NASPIS because a lot of the funds had NASPIS and it did so well that it became a disproportionately large part of their portfolios that they were forced to trim it back. And actually by for being forced to trim it back, that was to the investor's detriment. So to answer the question, if it becomes 25% of my portfolio, will I trim it back and it becomes more than 25? Well, I won't, but I will still manage the risk very carefully. You know, I don't want to, I, I, you know, it would probably involve ratcheting a stop loss up to contain the risk and run a trailing stop loss on a setup like that. So you can have the big position, but you've, you've got the risk well and truly under control. Okay. I see there are no more questions that are beyond that. So I'm going to wrap it up now. We've gone a little bit over time, but that's fine. So thank you very much, all of you, for attending. This was the fourth uh, session of this five-part webinar series. So next week, Thursday, is going to be the last one. Uh, same time, same place. That is the 1st of December. Okay. That'll be the last out of these. And we'll talk on that one about putting a box around it and a, a box trading strategy, which I quite like. It's quite simple. And um, I'll show you what that's about next week. Thanks very much for tuning in. I appreciate it. Uh, I've had good feedback on all of these webinars so far. So it's, it's great to get the feedback. And uh, I look forward to being with you again next Thursday, same time, same place. Take care. Cheers.